Tonight. I had been laying in my bed on my computer studying. She had sneezed, and when she came up, half of her face was frozen. An ABC 27 special presentation. I feel like an aching bad headache. It just all through my head. It just thumping like crazy. It was kind of scary. I mean, I didn't, I didn't what to expect. I thought, man, what the heck is wrong with me? I gotta, I gotta call for help or let somebody know what's going on with me. Penn State Hershey Stroke Center presents Stroke Smart. Brought to you by Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Good evening, I'm Chuck Rhodes. Having a stroke can be frightening, but it doesn't mean you can't recover. Quick action is the key. Stroke is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Stroke kills almost 130,000 Americans each year. On average, one American dies from stroke every four minutes. Tonight Thanks, Chuck. It may surprise you, but a stroke can happen at any age. A Penn State student found that out three months ago. Spring semester is almost over at Penn State University, and Rachel Nelson is getting ready to graduate. A few months ago, Rachel wasn't sure she would be able to wear a cap and gown. The unexpected happened to her. Thankfully, her roommate was there to help. I had been laying in my bed uh, on my computer studying and my roommate had come out to talk to me and she knocked on my door and I got up and I had come, kind of stumbled on the way to the door. I didn't really think anything of it. I just maybe tripped on something. We were just having a normal conversation and she had sneezed and when she came up her half of her face was frozen um, and something seemed off to me. I remember at one point I had spoken and she had been like, Rachel, what, wait, can you repeat that? And when I tried to, um, I couldn't because she couldn't understand because my voice was slurred. And she had said, Rachel, that's not funny, stop it. And I had no idea anything was wrong. I said, are you okay? Is everything okay? And she's like, yeah, everything's great, fine, nothing's going on. And I was like, are you, are you sure? And she said, yeah. And I was like, I, I don't think everything's fine. I didn't know what was happening, but she started talking about dialing 911, which I was so confused, there was nothing wrong. I, I thought I sounded fine, there was nothing, I couldn't tell there was anything wrong with me. Just, I thought she was just completely overreacting over something little. Rachel's condition declined within a matter of minutes. Her arm wasn't moving and she seemed to be off balance. Um, and then when we ended up calling 911, um, her, she started to fall over, so she lost like control of half of her body, I would say. An ambulance took Rachel to Mount Nittany Medical Center. By the time I got in the hospital, everyone was kind of confirming that it had been a stroke. And that's when I was like, okay, this is a lot more serious than I thought it was going to be. The ED physicians there were concerned about a stroke. And we set up an elaborate telestroke system with this hospital. And that was initiated. We will connect to Hershey Medical Center. We put all the patient's information in the computer. Once they activate the system and they contact us, we sign on via a laptop and we can look at her, look at her images, interact with her and the hospital staff and make decisions. I didn't know that hospitals had that ability to like, have like a kind of Skype conversation with somebody else so that you can actually see them and hear them to talk to them. Because of her significant deficits and the fact that she was still within the window to receive the IV clot buster TPA, um, we opted to go forth with that. And the sooner you give that medication, the more likely you are to be successful. After she got it, not everybody gets better right away. She didn't really improve. And because of that, I quickly sent her for a special CAT scan angiogram study to see what her vessels look like and see if we should urgently transfer her to our medical center. And within 20 to 30 minutes, that study was completed and reviewed. And there was a blockage in the one uh, major artery going out to the right side of her brain. And based on that and the fact that she wasn't any better, I urgently transferred her down here when you have to get helicoptered somewhere, that's really serious. Like, that's when people have some horrible thing that's happening to them. When she came to us, she still had significant problems, was still paralyzed on her right side. Um, but the first thing I remember was uh, talking to the doctor and just kind of explaining what he was going to do in the procedure. So the procedure we did for Rachel was called a mechanical thrombectomy. And this is a procedure where we take a catheter, a small tube, basically insert it in the artery in the femoral region, thread it up inside the body, park it in the neck, take a very thin catheter, place it through that one that goes all the way up into the brain, in Rachel's case onto the right side, 
Then through that we deliver a little mesh-like device in her case that uh, sort of like a stent opens up into the clot, grabs a hold of the clot, and then after a few minutes we pull that out while providing some suction in the bigger catheter in the neck. And that pulls out the clot most of the time. And we can see here that the artery is now open. You don't see that shadow anymore and you see all these branches filling out nicely. So a really uh, a nice result and we were able to get that done within basically five to ten minutes. And when I woke up, I was fine. I could move my hand again, which was nice, because not being able to move the left side of my body was pretty scary. Rachel spent five days in the hospital and shortly after returned to campus. Now she's back to studying and is ready to get her degree. So this is a perfect success story from significant deficits that may have changed her life forever to leaving the hospital entirely normal. I'm pretty much fully recovered. I have been able to catch up in my classes. I'm back to exercising again. I'm pretty much 100% normal. At this point, the doctors do not know what caused Rachel's stroke. Chuck, back to you. Thank you, Deborah. Now joining us in the studio, the co-directors, as you saw on the tape, of the Penn State Hershey Stroke Center, Dr. Kevin Cockroft and Dr. Ray Reckwine. Dr. Reckwine, I'm going to be begin with you. The first thing that jumps out at me and probably the viewers is her age. How rare is that to have such a young stroke victim? Uh, when you look at statistics, um, strokes can affect upwards of about a quarter of individuals under age 60, so it's actually somewhat common. A number of the causes are similar to the typical ones in older age, but um, there are some unique ones in younger people, congenital heart disease, cardiac defects they didn't know about, um, sometimes torn blood vessels um, in the neck or the brain arteries from even minor trauma, um, clotting disorders, and in younger women, birth control pills and migraine um, headaches with aura play a role as does sickle cell disease, so there's several different causes. Let's begin with a basic question too. What is a stroke? What happens to the body? What so a stroke is a sudden onset blood vessel problem, um, usually affecting the brain and infrequently the spinal cord. The, there are two major types of strokes. Um, the one is called an ischemic stroke. That's where a blood clot or debris blocks up a blood vessel. And then the brain tissue beyond that slowly dies over minutes to hours. And this is the most common, affecting about 85% of all people. The other type is called a hemorrhagic stroke. And that's where a blood vessel ruptures and dispenses blood throughout the brain, um, in and around the brain, and um, that affects about 15% of people. And depending upon the brain area affected, that dictates the types of symptoms they would have. Dr. Cockroft, I wanted to ask you, if we suspect someone's having a stroke, I mean, wh what do we look for? What are the signs? So the American Stroke Association and the National Stroke Association have come up with a nice acronym to help us remember what the signs and symptoms are. It's called FAST, F-A-S-T. So the F stands for face. You look for facial weakness or facial drooping. The A stands for arms. You look for arm weakness. And you could actually substitute leg or some, uh, some other extremity for that. S stands for speech. So you have problems with speech, uh, problems understanding speech or getting the words out. And then T is for time, meaning that uh, time is of the essence. The sooner you get to medical attention, the more likely you are to have different options for treatment, and the more likely you are to have a good recovery. The only thing that's missing from the fast is a headache, and that can be a major sign of a hemorrhagic stroke, the second type of stroke that Dr. Reichwein talked about. Dr. Reichwein, what, is there a person that's more susceptible to having a stroke? Do we, is there a candidate for that you can see ahead of time? There, there are several common risk factors for stroke and very modifiable risk factors and there's recent literature that suggests that four out of five strokes are preventable if you can modify those risk factors. The number one being high blood pressure or hypertension. Other common ones include diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, alcoholism, blockages in the um, neck or brain arteries, classically carotid artery disease in the neck. And um, as patients get older, an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation is a very common cause of stroke in the elderly. And then lastly, more recently, there's a lot of hype over um, anti-inflammatory medicines, non-steroidals, and what are called COX inhibitors. Those, if you use them in excessive amounts, may also increase stroke risk. Dr. And, Cockroft, t tell us, we saw in that report, and what excited me is the telemedicine. Talk about that. How's that playing into caring for stroke victims? 
So what are, one of the problems with caring for stroke patients these days is that the drug that you saw that Rachel got initially, this intravenous TPA, uh, there's still many doctors out there that are not comfortable giving the drug. They worry about causing bleeding or other problems, and so they're reluctant to give it. So one of the things that we can do with telemedicine is provide this two-way audio-video connection that allows outside hospitals to then use the expertise of Penn State docs to help make decisions about treatment and whether or not to give the drug. And that's really been a big bonus to the patients out of the rural communities. That's changing the game, so to speak. Absolutely. We talked about that earlier. Now here tonight to answer some of our viewer questions is Kathy Morrison. She is the stroke program manager at the Med Center. Here's our first viewer question. I've heard that women have different risk factors than men. Why is that? While many of the risk factors are the same between men and women, women who take birth control pills or estrogen replacement therapy increase their risk, particularly if they also smoke at the same time. That's a bad combination. Migraines with aura also tend to be more common in women, and this increases risk for stroke. But it is important to know that though our risk factors may be a little different, our symptoms are the same whether you're a man or a woman. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And we'll be back more with some more viewer questions. If the phone lines are busy, you can email a question to questions-stroke at abc27.com. Stay with us. We will be right back. You're watching Stroke Smart on ABC 27, brought to you by Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Welcome back. A Franklin County man feels lucky to be alive. He shares his story so others will know what to do in case this happens to you. Brian Parson believes he is a walking miracle. They just said that you're lucky to be alive. He was given a second chance and most people don't get that very fortunate. Brian was given a second chance eight months ago, a day he remembers well. Went to the bathroom to go to the bathroom to come back out and I noticed I had a sharp pain in my head. So um, I just sat there and thought, what's going on with me? And then um, after I felt the, the, the sharp pain in my head, um, I noticed um, I got, I felt like a pop in my forehead. And then after I felt the pop, I um, fell to the ground and fell over. My arm started shaking real bad, my right arm started shaking real bad, and then uh, I noticed my left leg. I couldn't move my left leg hardly at all. I had to move it with my arms. Brian managed to make an important phone call. I called 911, called for help, and the guy asked me what my problem was, and I said, I don't know, I said, I got like a real bad headache. And he said, okay, he said, um, I'm gonna send EMTs out. Well, we had been away uh, doing some errands and um, I got a phone call from Brian and uh, he said I just had to call 911 and I said Brian what's the matter and he didn't really tell me anything he just said that uh, the ambulance was uh, was in the driveway and uh, I'll have to go. The ambulance took Brian to a local hospital. They did a CT on my head and they found out that I had a rupture aneurysm. And uh, the doctor came in and they said there was no neurosurgeons that could do the surgery here. They said, you're gonna take a trip to Hershey Medical Center. Oh, I, I just couldn't imagine. It had to be really bad for him to be flying to Hershey. Hey, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was really wrong with me. He had a uh, ruptured anterior communicating artery aneurysm. That white represents blood, and that blood is in the subarachnoid space. So if you think of a blood vessel as a tube, an aneurysm is like a bubble on that tube. And just like a blister on a water hose, it's more likely to rupture. Once we find the aneurysm, we have to decide what we're going to do about it. We found out that uh, he was going to have surgery the next morning. It was kind of scary. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. More recently, in the last 15 to 20 years, uh, we've developed the ability to fix the aneurysm from inside the blood vessel. So we usually make an incision in the leg, probably about the width of your fingernail, uh, enter the artery, 
and then use the arteries as a pathway to the brain, going up through the abdomen, through the chest, through the neck, into the head, and then putting a very small catheter inside the aneurysm while placing platinum coils. And then when you have enough coils in there, so blood, blood is no longer entering the aneurysm, then you're done. Dr. Simon, the neurosurgeon, came in and talked to us and he said that his aneurysm was successfully coiled. He said, I see no reason why he won't recover and be able to go back to his normal routine. So that was a blessing right there. Brian spent a couple of weeks in the hospital, then transitioned to a rehab center for a week. They said, I'm doing good. They said that uh, you're responding really well and um, you know, you're, uh, you really surprised us. I think with the prayers and all the churches, I think that really, really made a difference. I'm very glad that he had such a good outcome. I just got a second chance to live. When Brian went to the rehab center, he was not able to walk. Within a week, he relearned how to walk and was able to go home. An amazing story, Chuck. It certainly is, Deborah. It's, it's amazing the progress we're making on all this. And Dr. Cockroft, what are the basic survival chances when you have a ruptured aneurysm? That, that sounds pretty serious. Yes, this is a particularly devastating type of a stroke. So only about 50% of people that suffer this kind of stroke will actually 50%. survive. Yes, 50%. And then of the survivors, about a third to a half of them will be disabled, not able to return to work or not able to take care of themselves afterwards. Talk about the treatments available for patients that have had a stroke. So there are a few different treatments available. And um, the, these would begin with some of the surgical procedures, which would include a uh, craniotomy, which is an opening of the head to remove a blood clot. Then there's the endovascular procedures where we go from inside the blood vessel to remove a blood clot. That's a thrombectomy that Rachel had. Uh, decompressive hemicraniectomy. This is a procedure where we take off part of the skull to allow the swollen brain to expand. And then there are the procedures for treatment of aneurysms and blood vessel malformations, one of which you heard about, where we can place either coils to plug up the aneurysm or a clip to clamp it off and then uh, surgeries to remove the uh, blood vessel malformations. Dr. Reichwein, what about treatments other than surgery? Can you talk about those? There are several medication therapies that have been more recently shown to um, decrease subsequent strokes and actually help the blood vessels heal. And some of these are commonly used blood pressure medicines, diabetes medicines, and cholesterol medicines, particularly the statin medications. And then also, with regard to atrial fibrillation, the irregular heart rate with advanced age, um, there are several blood thinners that have been shown to be very effective and three new blood thinners on the market now. And um, certainly um, just anything to stop smoking is beneficial. And then lastly, um, there's recent literature that more aggressively treating obstructive sleep apnea may decrease subsequent stroke risk. Dr. Cockroft, talk about high risk category. Is there things you can do to prevent this? Can we set a guard up against that if you're a high risk category? So if the medications and the lifestyle changes don't work, then there actually are some procedures that we can do to reduce your risk. Probably the most common procedure is called a carotid endarterectomy. This is a procedure whereby an artery in the neck, the carotid artery that goes to the brain, is opened up with a surgical procedure and the plaque or atherosclerosis that builds up in the artery is cleaned out. And then for the hemorrhagic types of stroke, we can treat brain aneurysms or blood vessel malformations before they burst. Dr. Reichwein, what about rehab? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that from stroke. So I always say strokes are disabling to some degree and after a stroke many people have some degree of disability and about a third of individuals need to go to or should go to an acute neuro rehab unit and the average length of stay there is about two weeks. If you go there there's about a three quarters chance you're going to be able to go home um, from that rehabilitation center and the motto is the earlier you get treatment generally the better you can do and our, our new conventional therapies, um, physical, occupational, and speech language pathology, but also um, newer um, devices and some selective medication therapies can also enhance outcomes. And now people over several months can dramatically improve and do much wow. better than in the past. So Progress so is amazing. Exactly. Seeing that. Deborah, let's check in back at the ABC 27 call center. Again, the phones, they have not stopped have not stopped. Why don't we get our next viewer question right now. This is the question is, my husband had a stroke in January. How can I best support his recovery? By encouraging him to eat well and to rest. 
these patients are so tired as they're recovering, and it's important they have energy for their rehabilitation therapies. Finding a support group in your area is really helpful. Um, they can be found um, on websites. You can go to the American Stroke Association or National Stroke Association websites for that. And don't forget to take care of yourself, making sure you have enough energy and that you can help to encourage him and support him. Okay, great. Okay, thanks so much. Welcome back. You still have a few minutes to get your questions in. The lines, as you can see, they are busy. This is the number to call, 717-346-3333. The phone lines are open until 8 o'clock this evening. Now, this is the last viewer question tonight. My wife had a TIA. Is that the same as a stroke? A TIA is not the same as a stroke, although the symptoms are the same. A TIA stands for transient ischemic attack and the symptoms are temporary and there's no damage done to the brain. It's an, a useful analogy would be to remember that a TIA is to stroke like a heart, as angina is to a heart attack. It's a warning, it's a chance to prevent a stroke. So even though your symptoms may have gone away, you must get medical attention right away. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy Morrison, for answering our viewer questions tonight. And we also want to thank all the specialists here. Once again, these phone lines are open until 8 o'clock, so you still have some more time to get your calls in. Chuck, we will send it back to you. Thank you, Deborah. And Dr. Cockroft, I read that the Hershey Med Center is considered a comprehensive stroke center. Talk about that. What's that mean? So there are a few key differences between a comprehensive stroke center and a standard primary stroke center. So one of the main ones is that we take care of all different types of stroke at a comprehensive stroke center. We also have the catheter type procedures that you saw used for Rachel. We have 24-7 access to neurosurgical procedures like that were done for Brian. And we have a, a facility that has a neuroscience intensive care unit, so dedicated to the critical care of these patients. Dr. Reckwein, talk about the overall patient benefits of uh, going to Hershey. With a stroke. So, in in the word, um, we provide you know comprehensive stroke care across the spectrum of patient problems, from preventions to acute care to rehabilitation, and even community outreach programs. And we provide cutting edge, advanced levels of care that most other um, hospital systems can't provide. And we also have regional, national, and international stroke neuroscience experts that are providing this care. Well, obviously, we see the benefit of research. Let's talk about research. What's going on now with it? So there are several advances in research across, again, all aspects of stroke. One of the most interesting is focused on recovery, looking at um, newer um, IV infusions um, to include IV stem cells shortly after the stroke that can actually help the brain um, recover and heal more quickly. There's also some growing recent research on more aggressive um, blood thinner therapies right after a, a TIA or a minor stroke to decrease the subsequent stroke. Dr. Cockroft, I saw the, what is it, the Telstroke program? Yes. That's what it's called, I don't wanna get the name mixed up. We saw that used dramatically in Rachel's story. How many hospitals participate in this and how does Hospital A talk to Hospital B and, and that so on? Sure, so we, in the, we call our uh, Telestroke pro program LionNet or LionNet Stroke, and we have eight participating hospitals at the moment throughout central Pennsylvania, and there are more planned. In fact, I think two more will be coming on in, uh, in May, next month. And it's really, as we talked about earlier, been a, a real boon to being able to provide this high-end tertiary care for stroke patients to smaller hospitals that really would not have access to neurosurgeons or neurologists. Is there a constant update? Do you find out, like, uh on Tuesday, if something happens, do you know what hospitals are online? Are able well, to all the hospitals are online all the time, and we always have coverage and backup coverage to provide uh, the responses to them at any time of day, 24 hours, seven days a week. Do we have someone of your expertise on duty 24 hours a day? Hershey? Yes. Ready? Yes. So Both uh, from the hemorrhagic standpoint, uh, hemorrhagic stroke standpoint, which would be myself, and Dr. Reichwein from the uh, ischemic stroke standpoint. We all have colleagues there that are covering this telestroke network and are available 24-7. And how, how many times are people, how, how many stroke victims do you see on an average in a week? Or is, is, this, uh, is there such a thing as rush time, I mean, uh, like Monday nights or whatever? Well, there are some times that are busier than others. Uh, sometimes around holidays it tends to be busier. This uh, past few months have been quite busy with over 90-some patients with various strokes coming through the medical center. So it's, uh, it's quite a busy, busy process. It is. Well, thank you, doctors, for joining us thank here tonight. We learned.